I'm wearing the very first t-shirt that I ever designed. This, this is the logo I designed. Uh, the very first logo that we ever had. And this is the t-shirt, the very first t-shirt I ever purchased and made. Uh, it was off of Teespring. And uh, here it is. And uh, yeah, it's seen better days. It's a little faded, but um, it's amazing that I still have it. It still is with me and I wear it from time to time. I'm real excited to represent it. Um, I thought for the 50th episode and this intro that we would do something a little bit interesting and talk a little bit about probably the number one question that I get about Go Indie Now. And that is, how did you get the title and the name Go Indie Now? And it's actually an interesting story. Uh, so when I was a little kid, I was about... I don't know, 10, 11, um, my father took us to an independent wrestling show. It was in uh, a gym uh, in, a, in a high school. I think it was a high school. It might have been like a rec center. But uh, there was a bunch of performers there. And one of them was a wrestler, an enhancement talent for WCW and for WWE at the time, Mr. Mark Starr. And he was one of the big attractions he wrestled a good like 15 minute match and uh he did really well and in fact he won the match if i'm mistaken which he didn't do much of in wcw and and wwe which was at the time of course wwf and uh so we went to the show it was like on a friday and then sat that saturday we went and had lunch at carl's jr and lo and behold who was sitting there in the back was mark Starr. Uh, my father, uh, never a shy man, went right up to him, said, my son's really enjoyed it. My, my oldest son, Joe, Joe here, uh, couldn't stop talking about your match. And, and he asked me a bunch of questions about what did I like about the match. And I told him, you know, when he did this throw and he did that, and I loved how he played to the crowd uh, and, and all of that. And he told us an interesting story, and it never left me. I know this is really random, and it is a true story. And he told me that uh, oftentimes he would ask other wrestlers how to how to get past being an enhancement talent. How do how does he work to get to that next level? And they said you got to go on the indie circuit, and you got to go now, and you got to do all the indies. And that's why he was at that show. He was running an indie circuit he was he was booking a bunch of shows on the west coast because wcw at the time was on on the east coast and they were uh taping it was it was around christmas november time so they were done taping and he decided to take that time and run from the west coast where he has been training and run a bunch of shows up and down the coast i think he went through arizona and all that too but him saying that, and I don't know why, but that name always stuck with me. And that's how the name Go Indie Now came to be. When I was looking for a name, I wanted it to catch fire. I wanted it to say something about what we were doing. And, and thus, that's how it came to be. So Mark Starr, who has um, been deceased now for about eight years, unfortunately. He passed away at a very young age of 50 from a heart attack, as most wrestlers in that era have experienced uh you know there's been quite a few of deaths like that in very similar fashion and unfortunately mark was one of them it's too bad uh because it would have been cool to have him on uh to celebrate uh this but uh nonetheless we celebrate him uh regardless and uh thank you mark for always putting that that wheel in my head to turn and lo and behold it it uh it's something i never forgot through the curtains, greeted by cheers of Porky, Porky from the fans. Here he comes back again, this time leading the wild side, and they don't look too happy, Chris Champion and Mark Stone. Hey, Brian, I just saw that tape that you showed, and evidently you edited it because you didn't show the right tape. We did not lose those CWA tag team battles. They were stolen from us. You lost them. Okay, Brian, if you look at that tape, I'm not even a legal man in there, and it took two of them to pin us. And today, on this TV show, you're going to see who the new CWA Tag Team Champions are, and you're looking at them. 
Wild side over here looking at the belt. Mark Starr climbs back in the ring. Rick Morton waiting for him. Starr popped him with a fist at the top of the head. Morton sent him into the corner. Throws him backwards as he came out of there. Well, we did to him. You need to get him out of here and keep him out of here. We have seen enough of the wild side in here today, I think. Now you... I promise you, Joe Brown, we will get those belts back. No matter what we got to do or who we got to sacrifice. So there you go. That's why it's always time to go Indy now. And that's why it's time to start the show. So let's do that. here from Fiction Atlas Press bringing you your monthly marketing tip. And today I'm going to be talking about collaborating with other authors. Marketing can sometimes feel like it's just us against the world screaming into the void, uh, but it doesn't always have to be like that. One way that we can take some pressure off of ourselves and develop new strategies and relationships, which is essential to growth, is by collaborating with other authors in our genre. There are several ways to do this, including group takeovers, anthologies and box sets, group sales and giveaways, and uh, new release team-ups. So I'm going to be talking briefly about each of these today. The first thing is group takeovers. Uh, takeovers have actually evolved a lot in the last few years. They used to happen a lot in events and they kind of used to be more um, broad, I want to say, uh, less focus on genre and just, you know, like a big party that everybody comes to. But lately, uh, group takeovers have started actually happening in groups. Uh, and we've usually tried to narrow down authors that are in at least uh, a sister genre or our own genre so that we're promoting to the right people because marketing to people that are not in the genre that you read are probably it's probably not going to help you um, but lately we've been doing these more in groups which have been has been more effective uh, because especially because in groups unlike in events uh, when you post something and it gets other people commenting on it and liking it and stuff it goes back to the top of the group and so that gives us more visibility, especially on popular posts. Um, what are some things that you do in takeovers and what is a takeover? A takeover is when you go into an event or a group, which is more popular now, um, and you have a pre, uh, preset time. Some of them are 15 minutes, some of them are 30 minutes, some of them are an hour. Uh, or there actually are some that are like all day and you can take over a whole group. Uh, I usually like to do hour long takeovers because I have a lot of information I put out there. Um, but one thing that you want to do is you usually want to do like a small giveaway. Uh, you, that can be an ebook. It can be like a $5 Amazon gift card. Or uh, you can even come up with some creative things like naming one of your characters. Or, you know, letting the person that wins name your character. Or decide who gets to die. Or uh, there's all kinds of cool little creative things you can do with it. But you want to be there to tell them where they can follow you. Um, list all your socials list your newsletter, you want to show them what you're working on right now and um, what you have in your backlist if you've got time for it. Um, I usually do some teasers that are really visual. Visuals are really important in takeovers. I uh, make sure you have some, some great visuals and please don't use copyrighted images because that's illegal. Uh, find some images on stock websites or your own artwork, things like that. If you do use artwork from someplace like Pinterest or something, make sure you credit the author or leave a link back to them and that way your, your bases are covered. Um, but you want to play some games and I like to tie my games into 
whatever I'm promoting at the time. If I'm promoting something about um, a raven shifter, I'm going to somehow incorporate ravens into the game that I'm playing. Um, or if I'm doing anti-heroes, what's your favorite anti-hero? Tell me, leave me a gif of your favorite anti-hero. Um, I try to do things like that, that sort of tie back into whatever I'm promoting at the time. So you're getting them interested in what you're promoting, but you're also like playing a fun game with them and games and giveaways are usually what gets floated to the top of the group because more people comment on those. So group takeovers are an awesome way to promote. And one thing not to lose sight of while you're in a uh, group takeover, especially if it's somebody's release day that you're celebrating, make sure that you tell that author, you know, congratulations on your release. A lot of times I like to give away a couple of ebooks of the new release to uh, people who comment just because it's courteous. Uh, you want, you're there to celebrate the other author and their release. You don't want to take up and hog up all the time for yourself and make it all about you when we're supposed to be celebrating their new release. So that's like a little bit of etiquette for you on uh, takeovers. The next thing that we have uh, that is a way to collaborate with other authors is anthologies and box sets. I have participated and ran both of these. Um, I was a set leader for Rogue Skies last year, which made the USA Today bestseller list. And then I also am the um, publisher of Fiction Atlas uh, Press, and we've got five anthologies, and we've got two more scheduled for this year. We put out two a year. Um, anthologies is a great way for authors to come together, um, usually under one set theme or genre, or a few, few sister themes or genres. It's a way for you guys to collaborate together and put, pull all your resources together, like money and your contacts and uh, even your marketing strategies. You can learn all kinds of things from other authors who have already done, you know, done this before. It's a great thing, especially for rookie authors to get into uh, because it gives them some more exposure once they're paired up with some of these more successful authors or people who've been around for longer uh, and it gets you some experience and it helps you especially financially if you're going into something together to market something you've got more people marketing it together in multiple ways in free ways um in artistic ways i've had we have uh one person who always submits to our anthology who is amazing uh, K Matt, she does this amazing artwork. Uh, she does some comic series and things like that for her own uh, her own series is illustrated, and um, she's been doing some free publicity for us by you know taking different things from our anthology stories and illustrating them for us as a thing that we can share uh, to promote the anthology. So there's all kinds of different creative ways that you can come together to promote, even if it's not about money. Um, but it does help to have, instead of having one person trying to book $300 worth of uh, release day ads, it's a lot easier if you've got 10, 20, 30 people to share that load and be able to have people not only helping you m with the money, but helping you um, with the manpower of booking all these ads and making sure that they go out on the correct day. And I'm a big data hog, so when I did Rogue Skies, we had spreadsheets everywhere, but it was a great way to collaborate with each other. We got to learn from each other, and we became kind of a family. Um, it's really a bonding process. I still talk to lots of them. I still work with them on different projects, and it's just a way to bond with other authors to see what they're doing and get involved in a positive way where you guys can come together, market something, and be successful. Uh, we guys, you guys probably all know that I'm the giveaway queen. I, I run all kinds of giveaways, probably 10 to 15 a month, some for individual authors, and a lot of them are group giveaways. But the more people that you can get together, um, like say from the book fair that I do, I usually get over 100 authors involved in that. So with all that manpower, I'm putting together this book fair that's got all of their books in it, hundreds of books. But we're getting also getting hundreds of authors sharing the book fair. Um, to all of their newsletter subscribers, which is usually over 300,000 subscribers. And we're getting millions of shares on social media. Uh, it's, it's crazy. It's a crazy amount of promotion all concentrated on one effort. So when you can get multiple people coming together and concentrating on one effort, that effort is usually very successful. 
Um, the same thing happens with these group sales, like you can do on Book Funnel and Story Origin. Uh, I think Prolific Works has it. Um, and this is basically when you take your books and you use those platforms to run a sale. It's usually around a theme. And um, you all schedule a, a day that you're going to send out in your newsletter. And everybody sends it out during the promo period. And you guys collectively get more sales because everybody is is sending it to one landing page, basically. Cause think about you trying to promote your book on one landing page, your book, just your book on that one landing page, and how successful you could be if you had 100 people also, so, also promoting that landing page with you. And so that's kind of the idea of these group sales, is putting everything on one landing page and sending as much traffic as possible during a certain amount of time. Um, I really, really recommend Story Origin and Book Funnel for those um, sort of promotions. And the last category I have is new release team ups. Now, what is a new release team up? Um, I've actually done this with pre orders before. I haven't actually done it with a new release, but I've seen many people do it. Um, what you do is you find an author friend who writes in the same genre as you, and you guys create a promotion together usually a promo, promo graphic that has both your book covers on it and or a pre-order incentive like um, if you buy both books and you send us your proof of pre-order we will send you this anthology that we wrote or these uh, downloadable um, coloring pages or things like that and this is usually done by two authors but you can also do it with two groups of authors we did it with two box sets before and uh, you can do like little battles. We had a battle where we try to see who could get more pre-orders in each week. And you make it a little bit competitive, but also very friendly. And it's just a way for you guys to promote each other, uh, promote each other in your newsletters, on your social media. And you're just teaming up to bring visibility to both your projects at one time. Because the more people you have involved, the greater your chances of success are. And by making a game out of it, like a competition, who can get more, or uh, which which team would you rather have? Like if you're doing two box sets and one's, or if you're doing two books, one's about vampires and one's about werewolves, you can say uh, who will win, the werewolves or the vampires. And it's just a cute, fun way to, to garner up more publicity. Um, what all of these things have in common is that you are making connections with both readers and also authors. And making connections with other authors especially when it's based upon um, mutually helping each other and not seeing each other as competition is a real gift. You, you really get to know other authors, um, you get to learn from each other, and collectively you both prosper from it and usually create great relationships and friendships, which is just like a bonus. That's all I have for you this month about collaborating with other authors. Um, if you guys have any questions or comments, you can always email me at info at fiction-atlas.com and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. You can also message me on Facebook. And that's it for me this month. Uh, remember, it's always time to go and eat now. Bye.
welcome to going the now film reviews this is Gino Cooper here and today we're talking about raising Buchanan let's go ahead and share the screen this is a funny witty film that I really enjoyed and it's something that has now gone into my top 10 favorites um, the reason is not because it's it's not because it's deep because this, this is it's not really that deep it's, it hits all the basic family tropes um, loss, love, friendship, um, you know, learning a lesson, it, ha it hits all that. That's not why I like it. Um, I like it and it's moving to me, not just because it's such, you know, the dialogue is such so witty, so fun, but, and I'm trying not to tear up right now uh, because of Renee. Um, uh, most of you knew Renee as, um, Odo from Deep Space Nine, but he's been in a few, more than a few other things in his nice career. And seeing this film and having him play um, President Buchanan and doling out that advice, seeing the cast um, work with him, and then having the ceremony at the end, I think it's fitting. Um, I think to have someone who passed away recently that we all cherish and loved and have a film where he plays a pre president and he does it very well, very presidential, and then have it, have a posthumous funeral, that's all good, well and good. Now about the film. Um, <laughs> yeah, there are funny parts in it. It's, um, it's one of those films that, you know, you see people doing where you're like, is this going to work? And it does work. Um, the jokes, um, I like Kathy Shin the, the best, I think, from this whole thing, just because I like her acting, I like her personality, and she's a gorgeous person. Oh my God, so beautiful. Um, the main lead, um, she's so believable. I mean, like, <laughs> there's a scene in there where, and I, um, I'm not gonna tell you. No, I'm not gonna tell you because it's a good scene, it's wonderful, and you're gonna love it. I'm not gonna spoil any part of this film for you. Please go out there. Please watch Raising Buchanan, which has an 80 plus score on Rotten Tomatoes. But as we know, Rotten Tomatoes is being worth salt right now. But audience score, this film is beautiful. The lines are hit on the, their marks. The people are all there. And it really, really, in my opinion, it really brings about the meaning of friendship and how we hang together through thick and thin. But also how we help each other grow. So stay tuned for the trailer right after this. Please watch this film, um, Raising Buchanan. And you know, as you can see here, it's available on iTunes. So it's available almost everywhere you can get it. Um, streaming services. Um, so the links are down below. Check it out. Give it a review. And please enjoy one of Renee's last works because he, he is great. And I'm going to stop here before I start bawling. Because I feel like I'm going to start bawling um, just because it's such a great movie. And it, it took me a while to get this review done because of that. Um, please enjoy Raising Buchanan. And please remember, it's always time to go in and out. Hey, hey, did anybody find a wallet? I'll go check in the back. That's it? Everything go okay this week? Any episodes? No, no. Pretty good week. How about your work? You missing any time from your work? No, no, work's fine. Donuts aren't real challenging. But it pays the bills. I wouldn't go that far. Get your stuff. I'm not even dressed yet. What's the hurry? I just thought we'd stop by the freight building before we hit Errol's. Wait, is there mischief afoot? Do you guys want to see a dead president? Behold, James Buchanan. He was the guy right before Lincoln. He's supposed to be the worst president ever. He looks like a ghoul. Well, this ghoul happens to be the most valuable thing that's ever come through this dock. I know how we can pay off all of our bills. We're going to steal the corpse of President James Buchanan. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Isn't it? This could be our greatest adventure yet. Corpses, history, spy shit. This thing's got it all. But you're talking about kidnapping. It's grave robbing at best. You know you cannot possibly get away with this. I figured out an awesome plan. The drop will be at Washington and 40s. They were to put 150,000 out. Station. Station. Where our carefree future awaits. It's like criminal beautiful minds. It's brilliant. You're like an evil genius. Is this a joke? 
You stole a human being. A dead one. The rules are wildly different. I never saw you making more than minimum wage. Don't force me to set fire to the president. Don't get snappy. I'm just trying to wrap my head around why the voters elected a boob for president. A boob! Look, for $40,000, you can get him back. He's one of the state's biggest embarrassments. And we had Three Mile Island and Game 6 of the 93 World Series. Good luck selling your corpse, ma'am. Nobody cares about James Buchanan, right? You knew it was a risky path. Why do you persist? I'm persistent. I still can't believe how light his body was. Well, you take the moisture out of a guy and he's just a pile of sticks. This is your host, Regine. Tonight, I'm going to be reviewing the indie game Cat Lateral Damage. It was literally written by one dude. Um, doesn't get a whole lot indier than that. So let's see what kind of fun we can get into. Because really, that's all you do. You just... You are a cat. I need more toys. Those humans will pay. If you ever wondered why cats do things like this, it's because they're cats. Also, they get massive bonuses for knocking stuff off. Massive massive bonuses. So if you ever uh, come back and just find all your stuff on the ground, you shouldn't have made it so many points just to, you know, knock your pillow on the ground. Look at that. Bamboo, done for. Stuff breaks. It's, it's just great. Um, I don't know. I've, been, I've played this game, I don't know, probably half an hour. Because... Fundamentally, who doesn't love just mindless destruction at the hands of a harmless kitty cat? Well, I mean, I guess birds and mice don't think kitty cats are harmless, but hey, that's me! And especially not when they knock TVs off. So, the one of the things I love about this game is that like, yeah, there's time limits and stuff like that, but... God's power. Hey, we'll fall like Donkey Kong. Sorry for getting distracted. I'm a cat. It's what happened. Ooh, an event. Run through the power up. I now have an upgrade. Holy crap, Nyx. I have never run so fast in my life. Look at that. Yay, cat grass. Let's get some of that. Let's get the piss out of this plant. Oh, cat, no, we're off. He's a litter box. Of course you get stuff for beating the crap out of litter box. And hopefully you get stuff for beating the crap out of toilet paper. Oh, look at that, it actually unrolls. Guys, I cannot tell you how much fun this game is just for the simple fact that it really makes no sense. I mean, all you're doing, you're a cat, right? And so 
why wouldn't you as a cat be able to climb in the oven? Doesn't make any sense. You want to knock stuff off the stove? Sure. You want to get up on the on top of the fridge? I'm sure you can figure out a way to jump up there. Oh, let me up there. So this, this game is just completely entrancing. It's basically made out of non-stop distraction. And it's just heartwarming, innocent, fun, you know, harmless, victimless crime. You know, no one has to clean this stuff up. You know, much like if you just, you know, leave stuff running you know, in your own house, you never have to worry about it. So, one one other amazing thing is the options menu in this. Okay, so normally the, the options menu isn't anything, but check this out. It is a pause menu. P-A-W-S-E. How cute is that? And then the quality, you have perfect, you okay, and awesome. They spared no expense on cat fun. Which is just, I mean, it's just great. It's just great. So, you know, I, I picked up this indie game as part of, a, a, I think, the itch.io bundle. And there were a bunch of other games in here, but I've only been playing the indie ones, and so far they've just been completely amazing. I haven't played a mass published game in probably four months, three months, and, and I haven't missed it at all because these indie games, they're, they're simple, they're fun, and you know, when you buy something like this, the indie, the indie publishers, the indie authors, they get, they get great feedback. I've left reviews of all the games, so, I mean, if you like just wholesome, mindless, destructive fun at the hands of an innocent kitten, Please, check out Cat Lateral Damage. You can find it on uh, itch.io, and I think it's also available on Steam. So, this has been uh, Regine, uh, reviewing indie games. I'm going to be reviewing, hopefully, one a week. I've got, like, 4,000 of them now. So, please, go and pick up an indie game. You will not regret it. And if you do regret it, it was cheap. And you can just play another one. So, pick up an indie game, and just remember, it is always time to go in here. You know what? Let me just make you a mixtape.
Hi everyone, I'm Karina Gantus. I am the author of Illusional Reality. It's a young adult uh, fantasy paranormal romance. I'm going to read a small excerpt from the book now. Still she defies me, Kovon roared. While she breathes, she provides hope to those feeble Tassinians. Without her, I would retain control of the Channelings and of them. Declare to me, Jaycar, what is their thought of their princess? How do they react to her stubborn temperament? Too sad, my lord, they are blinded from the truth. She is pathetic. She has refused to acknowledge the crown, and yet they shut their eyes, convinced she is their redeemer. The fools exist by the oracles. It matters not what they observe by sight. After our beloved Darthorn conjured and caused destruction on her land, she still declined to aid her kinsmen. They continue to retain hope, as most believe their future is predetermined. They fear you not, my lord. Is that so? Covon said. Then I will bestow upon them a reminder that sense finally has a ruler, a warlord that will instill fear into their hearts. Jacob kept silent throughout but he thought of a few comments he considered wise to keep to himself. Yet you compose error of your judgment of fire, Povon continued, for she is a powerful Ganti and possesses a gift. My father related this ahead of his decision to conclude his being. Jekar squirmed at Kovon's word. She is undeniably a powerful Tissinian, a worthy enemy one that ought not to be thought of lightly. Indeed, said Jekar. It matters not, she will be of little consequence, as she has refused to comply with my demands. I will eradicate their princess, and I entrust the deed in your capable hands. Jekar bowed. Very good, my lord. Kovon pulled a small ornamental bottle from beneath his kimono. Let this liquid flow into Thaya's chalice. Kovon instructed. The poison will react immediately when she swallows it. It matters not how little, but the poison is lethal. Now to Valkan's skills could aid her. Within moments she will cease to exist, and I will have removed to Simeon's saviour. Thereafter I will obtain my reward, as will you. I am eager to serve and satisfy my new master. It will be done. Jacob turned to leave. Jacob. Kovon called out, do not fail me. My lord, I will surrender my existence to your cause, and so you will if you fail. Kovon dismissed him. Why did his father amuse him with the Tassinians for so long? He was a pathetic fool. Kovon had always considered his father to be a fierce warlord who was feared by all, but now he knew different. There was no order within the city, and even though the Senks were loyal, they showed a lack of respect for their new lord. Kovon remedied this almost immediately. What did a loss of a few lives matter to him? It was a small price to pay for respect. Within weeks, their food supply was rationed, as it was more important that produce was sold rather than eaten. Kovon needed allies outside of Senks if his plans for domination were to succeed. He needed to contact the outlanders. His villages had barely enough food for themselves and could not afford another mouth to feed, so breeding stopped, which was Kovon's intent. Saints were publicly flogged if they grumbled about the terrible conditions, and if any dared to break the warlord's command, they were tortured into obedience or died under the effort. Able Senks were trained with weapons, thus increasing Kovon's army, though half of them would have turned and ran at the sight of any battle. Within a month, Kovon finally was satisfied that he had the respect he demanded from his kinsmen. His plan was in motion, and he relished the thought of the Tusinians on their knees. That was a small excerpt from my book, Illusional Reality. It's part one of the duology. Uh, book two is also out and both of them you can get on Kindle Unlimited. Thank you for watching.
I was just a girl from music school. At school, I met Mal and Ben. We became best friends, bandmates, a songwriting trio, my tribe. Now we live together and make music together in a cool house in Malibu. The label loved our demo. They want five more songs. How are we ever gonna afford this? I did a terrible thing. My high school boyfriend proposed and my whole family was pressuring me. Just give me one good reason why you wouldn't marry him. Because mom, I'm engaged. You've got to settle down. You don't think we did this all on our own. No, we got help from the trust fund. Every female in the family inherits a piece, and when she gets married, she gets to do whatever she wants with it. We just found out that if I get married, I inherit a bunch of money from a family trust fund. Girls, th this is the answer. Let's get married. You, me, Mel. We already raise a dog and share a Netflix account. You're crazy, but I'm in. Allie. I'm in. I'll just go wrap these up for the three of you. First, Mel tells her family that after years of friendship, she and I fell in love. I, um, I got married. Dan! Pick up the phone! Right now! Mel gets the trust money, and we are on our way. I'm talking Grammys, multi-platinum albums. I met the most amazing girl today. How do you know my daughter? Oh, she's my um, uh, personal trainer. She, I'm, I'm doing a triathlon. You are uh, Allie's boyfriend? Uh, okay, okay. Just... it doesn't fit me. It's fit size for you. I've got to put up with your multiple dating, your bisexuality, and your high sugar diet, which makes you, frankly, damn moody. This was not in my prenup. I know we're a little different, but no matter what anyone else says, this is family. No matter what happens, we'll always be together. You, me, and Allie, we're family now. is forbidden for the high priest of ancient Atlantis to fall in love. But even the greatest mage of the ages is only human. How can pure love lead to total destruction? Find out in this epic saga by writer Lloyd Smith and artist Russ Martin. This is the origin of Ash Amon. Author Paul Davis, writer of the War of Chaos and Order series. I will be reading the third book from that series today, a segment from Ghost Monkey, an India-inspired novel. For reference, the Janav are shapeshifters. For a brief moment, they could see Torchlight as Bajo declared, BREACH! Then writhing coils of sickly green poured in. Bajo did not hesitate. His claws ripped into the flesh as a snake Janav bit him. He took another snake by the jaws as it lunged and ripped it open from the mouth. Back to the thousand hells with all of you! The honey badger cried out, eviscerating another with its claw. Coils loosened until torchlight burst through, and the four entered the pit. The pit was chaos. Snake Janav wrapped around warriors, striking them repeatedly with venomous fangs. Other snakes remained as men, the only tell of their skin shimmering like scales. So Grievous struck a snake on the head with a staff, crushing the skull with a crunch. He howled at his kill, gaining him more attention, and his staff swung in a flurry of motion. The venom finally hit Bajo, and he swooned to the side. Bagheer said, Form a perimeter. Bajo is taking a nap. Bajo tried to wave him off as he stumbled to his knees. Get away from me, you daft panther! I fend! He stumbled. Labda struck a fang with his warhammer as it leapt for Bajo. Trauma ruptured its spine. Get some rest, Bagheer said. We'll leave some for you. The honey badger was already gone, napping in the din of battle. 
As the breach teams were whittled down, the army on the surface swarmed down. The distraction worked, the Fang's front line thinned. It was a blessing from the spirits that Sagriva's team lived. Bajo stood up, wiping drool from his mouth. He eyed up the Fang corpse in front of him and waddled toward it. I'ma eat well tonight. Sagriva thwacked him with the staff. Bajo, focus, snakes. Deeper in the pit, a massive fang slithered up. He grinned and went to work. His coils wrapped around a man who shifted into an elephant in an attempt to rip the snake in two. Instead, the snake stretched, spun around him several times, and scored the elephant with deep marks as if with daggers. He sprung from the elephant, opened his maw impossibly wide, and swallowed a man in a single gulp. A third he bit with fangs so large they impaled the warrior. Sugriva twitched with a desire to flee, as fear wrapped around his heart and squeezed. This was not a fang. Only the stories of the long-gone demons matched what happened. It's Issy, Bajo said, staring in awe. The leader of the fangs. We found his pit. All four stared as it continued to carve a bloody path. Panicked warriors fled, but Issy was too quick. He pounced from one to the next, leaving pulp in his path. We got to kill him, Basho said, rolling his shoulders and cracking his neck. The gear said, we may be wheat thrown to the mill, but it is our obligation. Bajo laughed heartily. These are all fodder. We are not fodder. Two dozen warriors held Issy at bay when they arrived. Sagriva jumped down, prepared to strike Issy's skull. The snake recoiled to strike. Sagriva shifted into his monkey form. The gear pounced, catching the snake right under the jaw. A fillet was slit from head to gut, spilling copious amounts of blood. The blood was like pitch. The gear shifted into a black panther and bit deep into the flesh. As he, soon as he tasted blood, he stepped back and spat. This is not blood. This is the corruption of demons. Labda said, it is a fang. They've been corrupted for years. The man took his zagnol and crushed the hammer down on the snake's tail. The Dagran pierced through and went deep into the earth, hitting the monster. Issy simply split his tail, slithered off the spike, and reformed. I agree with Bagheer, Labda said. This is not normal. He looked up in terror as he gained Issy's attention. By the ancestors, we fight a demon.
Hey there, I'm V.S. Holmes. I'm a sci-fi fantasy author and creator of the Blood of Titans world and the Starts Edge Nail Bentley series. And today I'm going to be reading a bit from Blood and Mercy, which is the final book in my Reforged series and comes out on the 27th. The fourth night on the trail, wolves circled the tents. At the camp's edge, where cook fires burned, they crept even closer. Re leaned over, peering past the licking flames at the bright eyes and blinking at the edge of the firelight. Already the weather was colder, the air carrying teeth as sharp as those glinting several paces away. You think they'd be frightened with this many people, she signed to the woman beside her. The guard spared a glance for the predators. War makes everyone hungry. It's been centuries since wolves were seen this far west. They've probably come to eat our dead. She turned back to her bowl with a shudder. Re winced and looked back to the camp's boundary. The glittering eyes were gone, just a memory lit on her eyes when she closed them. It would take another week to reach Athlon's capital, more if the river crossing tomorrow went poorly. Even March as a, as a foot soldier didn't take this long, thousands of pounding feet beating their steady way across dusty grasslands. It was hard to manage the transition from soldier to dignitary, but the differences in the march made the gulf between the two yawn wider. When she saw that Bimet was through with her food, she leaned forward. I have something to ask of you. Are you certain that's a good idea? Bimet's gaze moved from Ri to the looming tent of the Emperor's ambassador. Vilban's shadow paced the tent wall, pausing when a runner appeared. Ri raised the spear beside her. It was mostly decorative, but the blade was sharp. I'll be quick. Her fingers curled with ease, forcing casual comfort into the conversation. The guard's shoulders heaved in a sigh, and she fell into step beside Ri as they set off through the camp. Once out of the eyeline of Vilban's tent, Reducked between the gently waving fabric walls of the larger barrack tents. Guards paced the edge of camp. Already she caught sight of armbands, caught glimpses of a fist, rising, opening, liberty. She settled on the outcropping, legs tucked beneath her, and raised her face to the soft air. There was little time to acquaint herself with the surrounding women, but there would be chance enough upon arriving in Atherlon, where they would be watched more, but understood less. Bimet found an outcropping still within whistle distance of the camp, but outside the reach of firelight. Of Ree's half-dozen attendants, she was the only one she'd known before any of this. Their troops had worked together often, and the red armband she donned on the second day of their march told Ree enough. I don't like this, Bimet signed, lips pursed. Ree shrugged. There's no other option. I can't trust letters yet, not until I'm safely in Atherlon. There are too many eyes on me, and not only the bonds. Then I assume it's important? Fourth riding is being transferred to a nearby town, she said, by way of answer. A little one I can't remember the name of. Bimet watched the glowing orbs in the trees bob and slink for a moment. And? Beneath Ree's hand, the rock was rough, ragged, and gray. Gone was the smooth red of home, the earth stained red by rust or blood. Her fingers curled in the crags, a tether to this changing world. They're led by Baniel Desfal of the Third Ark. I don't want him to leave the town alive. I know there are sympathizers there. She fixed be met with a pointed expression. Understood? Understood. I'll get the word out now. It'll go out with the morning progress reports at dawn. Be met rose, hand pressing the small of her back when she straightened. I'll walk you back to camp. Ree shook her head. I can manage myself. The messenger's tent is on the other side of camp from ours. When be met was gone, Ree's attention drifted to the darkness before her. A small piece of her wished, fleetingly, that she could disappear into the makeshift roads and slip away into the night. She would not, no matter how inviting the dark woods and winding trails might be. But for a few moments she could pretend. In a fortnight's time, she would be in a different type of forest, one of cold white stone and looming duties. Already she missed Kielt, already her heart ached for home. A woman will bleed and die for Bon. She would see them again in a year, perhaps two, on the field of battle. Somehow, she would find a way, find those who would join their cause. In Atherlon, isolation would be their greatest ally. She just hoped she could survive it long enough to see her rebellion through. Not for the first time, she wondered what his majesty looked like, how he might act. Would she wish to sew his mouth shut, as she so often wished of the Baniel? Would he learn her signs? Would he be kind? She drew a long, slow breath. She was a soldier, and marriage was war. Thank you so much for listening.
went inside and looked at it and saw that it hadn't been remodeled since it opened and was like, oh, this fits the bill aesthetically. And Greetings fellow humans and welcome to another indie music review by your friendly neighborhood scruffy JD Estrada. Um, last month I brought to you a bit of ethnic chaos from the Ukraine with Daka Braka. Um, this is uh, Le Fils de Iligadal. Why am I bringing stuff like this to try something different? Um, musical exploration is something that I've always enjoyed and just, just diving into different things is something that's always fascinated me. And as a writer, it helps me tap into different things in my brain. Um, different languages, different instruments, different rhythms, everything fascinates me and I think that uh, everything can help us reach deeper into the, the wells of our soul because it's not, we're, we're not one dimensional. So why act like it? Um, and seriously, I think that deep down, even with all our conflicts, even with all the strife, even with everything that we're living now uh, and the crazy times that we're living and the creative ways that we segregate, uh, differentiate, discriminate uh, against one another, um, I think that we're all in this together, and sure we may have different things, but we we share a common thread. We share a common soul, if you will. That's try. That's why I try my best um, to find different things in Go Indie now. Um, we've had rock, we've had punk, we've had hip hop, we've had metal, we have ambient, acoustic, cello, piano, uh, solo guitar. And last month, as I mentioned, I, we had uh, Daka Braka. And, you know, I just want to share different things with you, different things that wouldn't reach us otherwise. Um, the search for the music that I review is as random as it gets. And I try to follow my gut. And I actually had another selection for this month, but it, it wasn't necessarily indie and it wasn't necessarily uh, a current, but it was definitely something that I also think resonates, but I'll review that uh, independently. Uh, since it's not an indie band and it's not someone that can actually benefit from our support, which is part of why, why we do what we do and how we do it. Um, but seriously, um, I think that listening to music like this lets us tap into different things. Um, people go, what is that? And, and first off, when you see that, that, that the guitar has its own rhythm and it's just, it just hits you differently, I think there's beauty in that. And I, I, I felt the need to dig into more, more options for world music and something that's more accessible. There's some things that you listen to that it's like, you know, full on Calypso and it's like not for everyone, but I hear this and I can easily think of so many writers, high fantasy writers, science fiction writers, uh, just tapping into this and accessing you know, different things in their brain. And I love the thought of that, uh, hopefully helping someone else discover something that will help them discover something within themselves, if, if that inception-like description makes any type of sense. Um, but I chose this band for a couple of reasons. Firstly, if it weren't for technology uh, and global reach, we would not know of so many bands. Um, seriously, getting to where they come from, uh, as in uh, Le Fils de Ligadar, it's a grueling 
journey. I, I, I looked it up and it's, it's a trek, I don't know how many hours through the desert to end up in a place, um, to a village that has no electricity and no water. Yet these people were able to record something that me in Atlanta can share with you on the internet so that wherever you are, you are in the world, if you're watching this, you can go, let me check it out. That's amazing. Um, secondly, I chose this band because they remind me a bit of uh, Tinariwen. If you've never, they're also like in that, that desert, um, desert blues vibe of, of like um, African and Arabic and, and different influences like that. Uh, Tinariwen is, is top-notch. Um, I didn't go see them because I didn't have a chance and they actually did come to Atlanta. Um, but I wanted something in that vein because also playing guitar, I love the things that they do. They keep it sparse, but they keep it interesting for me. Uh, thirdly, many of these compositions are use few elements and I think that's also an invitation to anyone to pick up an instrument and see what comes out. Um, I've shared several music videos uh, of original songs. I'm not a virtuoso by any means, but I share it and some people connect with it, even if it's a handful of people. And I think in these times, it's interesting and important as well um, to connect in as many ways as possible. Um, <clears throat> Lefif has guitars, some hand claps, vocals, maybe the occasional drum or stuff like that. That's it, um, and all you need to create music it can you know it can get as basic as you want, and you can create something beautiful. Um, that song that I have right now is Terinit. This one's Egas Malon. Look at the guitar. This is someone from a village just below the Saharan Desert. What? And ah, it's just it's just so cool, and I love discovering stuff like this so that I can share it. Um, because for me, there's there's just so much beauty in in the world and in the music that we share and the the, the ways that we can link. Um, a fourth reason that I chose them is that this is actually a female-led and driven avant-garde group of black women from the other side of the world playing desert blues. Um, their music stems from, from tradition in a village halfway across the world, and they are preserving and modernizing that tradition. And I think there's something really beautiful in that. Um, they, and some people, I hate this comment, but some people say that uh, there are no original ideas. Every story's been told or, or whatever. Okay, then give me a new spin, give me something different. They're taking the tradition from their village that would just be insular as it gets, and they are modernizing it. Um, and if you hear this, you're gonna you're gonna get desert blues. You're gonna get that Dinari one feel, but you're also gonna get occasional feels of of other stuff. Um, it's like folk rock from Africa, Northern Africa, slightly Sub-Saharan Africa. But it's a beautiful thing. And again, if you're writing something that's sci-fi or high fantasy, and you're looking for diversity, and you're looking to tap into different things that feel genuine, that are real, um, this is a good option, because why not? Because in times of strife and division, music unites us, regardless of age, gender, race, nationality, even language. And I really wanted to share this as an invitation to you, as a musician, as a writer, or as a human to look beyond what you know and find the things that bring us together if only for a song or two so check them out maybe it's not your cup of tea i promise next month i'll bring you some some good old rock and roll next month i'm gonna bring you some hip-hop and we'll keep mixing it up because as humans we are more beautiful the more that we explore our diversity so till next time keep it real Keep it diverse, keep it indie. Cheers.
Hey everyone, Rebecca Jonesy here. I am the author of the Mabstall series and COO of Three Furies Press, and I am here today to give you another uh, little editing tip. So one of the things I tell my authors um, fairly often, actually, is um, to, when you're doing a video, always have a cat walk through the background. It, it makes, the, makes the video much more personal. Um, I also tell them that when they are editing their books, the best way for them to do it is to um, set it aside, give themselves a break and then come back to it later. Well, another way to do that if you're short on time or you just need that extra um, step away from it so that you um, you can view it with fresher eyes is change the format. So if you've been doing your writing in, in a Word document, open it up in a PDF. Uh, take a look at it that way. Or if you can, go ahead and convert it into a ebook format and read it as if you were just, you know, the actual reader. If you can't do that, or even if you can and just, you know, want to do it a slightly different way, you can also have it read back to you. Now, there are plenty of programs that do that. Um, Word will do it. Your phone will do it. Uh, Ebook readers will do it. Um, there are plenty of different ways you can, you can, you can accomplish that or you can go the old school route instead of the high tech route and just sit down and read it yourself. Read it out loud as if you were your own narrator. I have found uh, from doing live readings that it is a really good way for me to catch the little slip ups maybe. You know, I shouldn't have used this word so often, you know, in, in two paragraphs back to back. A ripple started in the middle of the lake where the water was the deepest, deeper even than the humans knew. There were a few that did know. There were a few that did know. More ripples formed, following, followed closely by a bubble that burst into the air and sent all the small animals quiet. They knew the type of dangers that could rise up from the water. It's also a really good way to check your book um, to make sure that it is good and ready to go in case you're going to be doing an audio book, either now or in the future, whichever way, you know, you yourself decide to work it out. But it gives you a, a really good idea of how it sounds in other people's heads. Don't forget most readers do, you know, they, they have a play that runs in their heads as they're reading a book. And that's what you really want them to do as well. Because um, that, you know, helps bring in the catharsis of, of reading. And that is something that every author should strive for. So find a way to get your step back so that you can hear it, see it, feel it, appreciate it in a, you know, in a slightly different way. And you will make sure that you reach more readers that way. And that's it for me today. Once again, I am Rebecca Jonesy. And I will see you guys next time. Read well and prosper. Hey everybody, yes it is I, Joe Compton again. Welcome to the Indie Brew Review. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about my namesake. Uh, and their summertime brew going through the drive-thru. Social distancing, you know, drive throughs are a really good thing right now for social distancing. And this is a really good thing for social. So, let's talk about drive through red.
Yes. Trader Joe's, or more aptly, the Joseph Brow Brewing Company, which is, of course, Trader Joe's, if you didn't know, has their summertime release. And it is a dry hopped red ale, 7.2% alcohol, with a 42 IBU. It's pretty good stuff there. It's called Drive Through Red. Uh, it is a very brisk, caramelish uh, amber. Uh, it has the uh, nice kick like a Killian's red does, but it also has a very interesting, not not aftertaste, but a nice forward taste that I think you would compare to some IPAs. So if you're an IPA fan, Looking for a little bit of a stronger mix, this might be a good brew for you. Uh, as I mentioned, Trader Joe's, my namesake. Well, well I wish. <laughs> anyway, uh, they're doing good stuff. If you don't know, if you don't have a Trader Joe's near you, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, it's a great place to get a lot of great beers, especially beers that they brew themselves. They've always had some really interesting stuff. There was a blueberry stout a few years ago that I got hooked on for a while it was really really good um and i never i'm not a big fruity guy or a big fruit beer guy um so it's interesting that uh you know i got into that a little bit this is a straight up beer though the, it's hoppy it's very very strong it has if you pour it into a cup it'll pour perfectly it'll give you that nice foam head on it uh, it is one of those beers that's very, very rich and smooth. It's it's an awesome drink, and like I said, it's it's a seven point two, so that's pretty good. That's a pretty good alcohol content too. They'll knock you in your butt after a couple of them, uh, but it is a very good social beer too. Uh, it doesn't do as well in warmth as some beers would, like a lager or you know a thinner beer. This is a thick beer, so it's going to sit, and when it sits. It is going to get a little bit muddy. It's going to get uh, a little bit warm, and that doesn't always tend to lend itself to a beer like this. Although I'm drinking it at room temperature right now, and it's pretty good. Um, it's 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 solid. It ha it doesn't it doesn't uh, have any weird taste or aftertaste or anything like that. But I think it needs to be room temperature. Actually, uh, I think if you put it in the fridge, it'll thin. And if you leave it in the sun, obviously, it'll bubble and become, eh, not very good. It'll, it'll taste pretty sour, actually. So try it out. Go check out my namesake. If you're at a Trader Joe's, it's right there. drive through Red. They have it in abundance. I've been told that if you're at Trader Joe's and you can't find it, they will find it for you. So that's the cool thing about Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's is such a friendly atmosphere, great place to shop. And a great place to get beer. Check them out. Enjoy. Cheers, everybody. And remember that it's always time to go indie now. It's always time for good indie brew. Like this one. Hello and welcome to this month's review for Go Indie Now. This month I am reviewing Pathosis by Jason Lavelle. and they are quickly becoming my favorite author. So this story is perfect for pandemic times like now, but it goes beyond just a virus. It's a horror novel with a touch of apocalypse and spiders that will make you jump every time you see a shadow move or have a hair tickle the back of your neck. So this story is the perfect horror tale, enough scare both of the jumping kind and of the psychological kind. So here's the blurb. A sloppy extermination, evidence mismanaged, and all of America is at risk. 
Coast Guard Lieutenant Emily Brisbane is in charge of a strange ship at her dock. Everyone on board has been ripped apart. Even more disturbing, some of the bodies shown teeth marks, human teeth marks. Before she can conduct a full investigation, she needs to clear the ship of aggressive spiders attacking her investigators. Jack Wolfgang has seen a lot of strange things in his pest control job, but nothing like the ship. Picking through the bloody decks is bad, but spiders who hunt men is just too much. The government lady isn't paying him to risk his life, so he does the bare minimum before heading home. Now for the review. So like I said, this isn't just spiders and it isn't just a virus. This is a truly creepy tale that unravels like a mystery at first. But once you discover what is really going on, the creep factor only intensifies. Add in some good old apocalypse, apocalypse times with guns and you have an epic climax and ending that you never saw coming. Another thing I love about this book is the sheer knowledge you can find in the writing. Facts about spiders from the exterminator and knowledge of guns from the protagonist. It's obvious the author was passionate about these facts and did their research. But they didn't info dump the facts. They were presented beautifully into the narrative where they fascinated me and helped immerse me into the story. It just made everything so real and come to life, especially the spiders. So it's not easy to write about the end times, especially since most stories are about what happens after the big event. So I was pleased that this was during and not after the big event. It was so interesting to see things unfold and happen in real time, and it was well done, not an easy task. As I said in the intro, it's not just jump scares. It really adds levels by jumping into psychological scares as well. So it is my favorite type of horror. If you want to be afraid of spiders and other creepy crawlies, definitely check out Pathosis by Jason LaBelle. So that's my review for this month. I hope you guys have a wonderful time. Catch up with Jason LaBelle and get Pathosis. And I will see you next month. Thank you. Hey, this is Allison Myers. I'm following up about the job opening in your design department. No, I, I already submitted a resume. No, I, I understand. It's already been filled. I see. You enjoy your job? This isn't really my job. I'm an architect. Just had setbacks. Come on, Neil. Are you Neil? That's right. That's not you. If we could get moving. Yeah, I have it. It'll be inside a black bag. She is, but she'll be gone by the time I get there. You think it'd be possible to pull over? We're almost there. I'm afraid I'm gonna have to insist. I do for you, officer? Looking for a pair of earrings. Emily Jane. Last week she was stabbed eight times. It's a very nice bracelet you have on. I feel like something really bad is going to happen. What about you, little Miss Driver? What are you really about? Let me ask you something. It's been the worst night of your life.
not that scary, am I? Talk about, was, was the concept drawn from experiences doing like an Uber kind of thing, or how did you come up with this idea that it started with? Yeah, so Adam Armstrong, one of the writers, uh, actually drove for Lyft for a while. Nice. Um, so I believe some of the stories were a little inspired by his experiences. Um, but we actually, um, th this was a project that we ended up kind of falling into a situation where we were able to make a film. Oh, nice. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I turned to Adam Armstrong and Marcus DePivo and I said, guys, we, we need to have a, a script that we can do. Do we have anything that we could do for this budget? And they were like, mm. uh, so so they're like, let us let us walk away. We'll come back in a week and we'll let you know uh, what our ideas are. Sure. And uh, and they came back in three months and had the script, and it wow. was fantastic. Wow. When you guys when you guys got the pages, were you just blown away? I mean, obviously you don't know what you know right. until you know it. Right. So I mean. At the beginning of it, when you're reading it, are you are you already intrigued by these characters, and how and how did it how did your process work in terms of you know the dichotomy of what you're going to experience? Sure, I think the thing that turned me on immediately was that there's just this great deal of moral ambiguity throughout the entire piece, yeah. um, and I feel that the choices that these two characters are making seem to be fueled by a palpable desperation, mm. which I think plays pretty well to what a lot of people in the country are going through right now. And so they just kind of sat like a shadow on everything and that felt true to me and it felt honest to me. And then on top of that, I think it just plays as a really nice genre piece. Yeah. I love thrillers, I've always loved thrillers and horror films and so I think just having the opportunity to lean in and dive into something like that um, was was great. Yeah, nice. yeah, and when I was reading it for the first time, you know, I'm reading the full script to yeah. see if it's something that I would be interested Sure. In doing and I was with the story every every turn of the page like every twist I was pulled in and I felt like I was watching the movie and I was like oh my gosh what's going to happen next yeah and I didn't see what was coming awesome. so that to me told me okay this this is a project <laughs> that I would definitely like to be to be working on nice yeah you know and because it has such divisiveness and it has certain elements that have to be hit and certain points of the storyline what did the actors bring to it that you didn't expect going into the production? So much, so much. I mean, um, you know, the when we got the script, obviously, uh, you know, it was for for an indie film like this, um, it was it was fairly fully formed, right? Yeah. Um, but I think that the special thing that both Michael and Lizzie brought to the table is, is just this absolute and full commitment to these characters. Um, you know, the passenger is. <clears throat> this creepy but really charming guy right um, and it was always really important to us that he that he kept that charm throughout like we wanted people to like him and hate him at the same right. time sure. um, and I think that it you know I think that Michael just coming to the table with that already in place it just made the the whole thing so easy um, and then Lizzie of course I mean the Allison's character is so complicated. There's so there's so much under the surface that we don't immediately see. And so um, with Lizzie, it was just it was such a pleasure to work with her because we were able to choose little bits and pieces to to give along the way right, to sure. the viewer to, to to have them understand better like what she's going through and what she has to deal with and how she has to get through this crazy night. Um, so I think that. Both of these guys were just such a pleasure to work with, and I mean the whole cast was amazing, and they brought something special to each each and every role. And as part of developing that aesthetic too, I found like I mean it's a challenge just to light something, just lighting something, right? Mm -hmm. But you're in a car for ninety percent of this film. The lighting, you know, the dark shadows that creep over. I mean, probably a lot of that was happy accident, natural lighting. But talk about how you designed that and and how it played a pivotal role in this movie. So I would say some of that was a happy accident. <laughs> um, it's actually, I think that our cinematographer, Anthony Koontz, just did a, 
I mean, yeah. the film looks like a million bucks. Yeah, like, we didn't spend a million. It's the best bucks. shot. It's the best shot film I've seen at this festival. Wow, I mean, that's a huge compliment. Thank you so much. I mean, he he really, you know, we we storyboarded probably about sixty percent of the film before we went in to shoot it, um, and and uh, Anthony was our second DP to come on board. Nice. Um, and uh, when he came on, I showed him a lot of the storyboards. We talked through a lot of the shots, and he's like, you know, I really love uh, to to have these as conversation. But I think that a film of this scale, you know, we're really going to have to get on set and see what we can do. And I was just like, I will throw away every storyboard we've made if it means that, you know, this thing is going to look as good as you can make it look. And, um, you know, his, his, he had this idea, this aesthetic that he didn't want to just set up the camera in front of the car uh -huh. and, and, and have us, you know, rehearse and play scenes. He was like, okay. We're, as we get deeper and deeper into the story, we're going to get the camera closer and closer to these characters, and we're going to change the viewpoint of the camera as as our characters experience the story. Um, and and you know, I I'm familiar with photography. Um, I've shot things before myself, but the level of experience and depth that Anthony has that he brought to the table, I think, just made this film looks so good, made these guys look good, made me look good, you know, like, it, it, he really, he really blew it out of the water. And the, and the interesting thing, as far as an acting standpoint goes, there is a level where you have to be confident, and you still have this element of fear going out throughout the entire thing. Talk about how you balance those basically. I think that, you know, what we kind of learn about our passenger, um, a little more than halfway through, sets him up where, where what he says, his awareness of himself, might not be so sharp. Mm. And so I think that we see him do things that maybe take us aback and turn us off, but then we see him uh, make an apology for the thing that he just said because he recognizes after the fact that maybe what he did wasn't so friendly or, or, or you know, generous or, or, or wholesome or warm. And so I think that seeing this guy kind of stumble through and trying to be uh, just trying to be a guy getting from point A to point B um, without making somebody else feel uncomfortable and, and his, uh, how he's not so good at that um, <laughs> was really interesting to me because you're kind of trying to make a decision of what do I need from her and how do I get it and how do I get it without um, scaring her away, turning her off right, sure. and getting what I need, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. nice. I would say mapping out the intricacies of what is happening in each scene uh -huh. for Allison was one of my favorite parts of actually working on the movie. And every time that we were going into a new scene, Drew and I would have a little powwow and we would say, okay, where is Allison at this moment? What is she feeling? What are what is she allowing to be seen? So what is she, and what is she showing? What is she trying to play? Yeah. Um, and so those layers, you know, make her a very complicated character to play as an actor, but also I think make the script that much more rich because mm -hmm. there is so much going on underneath, you know, all subtext. Sure. I think one of the wonderful things about their performance in this movie, and speaking to, to your question, is just that, um, it's it's a special film in that when you get through the story for the first time, if you desire to go back and rewatch it, there are so many nuances to the performances that that really speak to you know the fear, but also you know the the confidence that that these characters have. Um, and I think it's it's a little bit of a different movie the second time that you watch it. Yeah, I probably agree. I haven't seen it a second time, but I will. I have definitely thought about that. <laughs> awesome. <Yeah. laughs> uh, I mean, for for you as a director, uh, this is. This is a movement piece, you know, but we're we're in a static situation, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to keep it moving and flowing with with the tensions and the and the angles. And we talked about the lighting and all that. Mm -hmm. But talk a little bit about um, the dialogue and and how you kept it natural and kept it flowing. Was was it was it a rigid script or did you guys have to open it up for improv? Did that feel like this was kind of that the, that make it more natural kind that's, of idea? That's a great question. Um, you know, Adam and Marcus are writers. They actually wrote the script um, very, very natural. Mm -hmm. You know, there was there were ums, there was stuff. Like we talked about multiple times. You know, Lizzie being like, "Do you know how many times we say stuff in this movie?" <laughs> 
Uh, can I cut some of those out? I was like, yes, of course you can. Um, with, with, with the dialogue in particular, it was really, um, you know, Adam and Marcus were generous enough to know that they, they were confident in the story that they wrote, and they said, we, we want that these characters to feel real on screen. So if there are little things that you need to change in order to make these characters feel more true to life, please do so. And I thought that that was just, um, it, it, it's something that shows their confidence in their own writing, but it also shows the confidence in the cast that we had put together. And I thought that that was just a, a, an amazing thing coming from them. Yeah. But as far as improving, you know, from an actor standpoint, we, we didn't really improv. Yeah. We, we wanted to honor the script that they had written, so we... Pretty word for word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty nice. word for word. Yeah. Once we had, you know, it, it was a thing like, if it's a word or two that we're changing, yeah, but other than that, it was yeah. never, we never had to retool anything major mm -hmm. at all. It was like, good to go from the jump. So from, from your standpoint and your process then, mm -hmm. It's all about how you look and what you're looking right. at and, and the little nuances that you play with your hands and everything like that, right? right. That's where you got to improv probably right. a yeah. lot right. more than you thought. And a lot of it is not necessarily about the words. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's about what's going on underneath or sure. what you want the other person to be feeling in that moment. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, how long did, how, I mean, this takes place over a night, yeah. right? Yeah. How long was the actual shoot? What did you guys go through in that process? Was this, was this you had to shoot at certain times and, and do that? <laughs> oh, yeah. So this was, uh, the, the, the shoot itself was a bit of a struggle for everyone. <laughs> um, we did, I think, two daytime shoots, two, uh -huh. day, two days during the day, like a normal work day. Um, and the remainder of the shoot, which was for about a month, uh, was all overnights. So, so these guys were actually wonderful because you know we wanted to keep our sleep schedule yeah. mm -hmm. in the very screwed up you know seven a.m. to seven p. Or, excuse me, seven p.m. to seven a.m. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so you know on our days off we would all end up getting up, calling each other, being like, all right, where are you? Where are you? Yeah. Let's go get some food. Let's go get some drinks. Like nice. let's. Yeah, it's, it's going to be Sunday fun day yeah. throughout the night, you know. But through, you know, didn't, not going to bed until 6 in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it actually served us so much better to yeah. keep the schedule. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Don't get sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It, it made going back to work the next day much easier yeah. since we didn't go back to a normal daytime schedule. Yeah. So, yeah, mm -hmm. we were vampires for a month. Yeah. <laughs> it felt good. Yeah. <laughs> Different, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you feel like that added to your performance, having that? I think so. Yeah. Just the mood in general yeah. and being in the place. I mean, there's so much. I think coming up in the theater, Lizzie and I both have uh, big theater backgrounds. And so being on set, being on location, yeah. which you just don't get to do very often unless you're shooting a uh, film, was, it, it does so much of the work for you. Yeah. And it was a pleasure. I mean, you get to, you're, you're responding to things that are really happening. And so it's, it's just buoying your performance that much more. Yeah. And all your job then is to just be present, be a generous partner, get what you need in the scene, and, and, and keep it moving. Um, but, but all those other things were just bonuses, I think. And what? at night, it's, there's, there's a mood anyway, right? right. So it's, it's moody, it's moody <laughs> sure. to begin with, yeah. which helps me Right, right, a lot. sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. So, I mean, have you guys seen the film? Already? Yes. yes. So, yes. so you, you've seen the final cut and everything like that? And yes. You've seen it probably a million times. I've seen it too many times. <laughs> <laughs> I still love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, my question is, it, it is like when you see yourself up there and you mm -hmm. see this film and you see what you've done and you've seen it over and over again, you constantly find the little nuances that nobody else can see. You know, the little mistakes or the little thing that you figure, oh, I should have held my look there a little bit longer yeah. or I should have cut when I should have cut. But I don't want to know that from you. What I want to know from you guys is what do you think you nailed? That's a great question. I think we nailed the twist. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 and I, yeah. Good, good answer. Yeah. <laughs> that, I think that was going to be my answer as well. Yeah. That, that's what feels the, the most rewarding and the best when I watch it. I would say that, uh, you know, the thing that, the thing that made me feel like we nailed the film in general was that uh, you know we've done like a private screening for cast and crew, and just the the fact that everyone who's involved in the project was proud of it nice. that made me feel like I did my job. You That's know? awesome. Um, and so, and you know the the I think the one thing that I feel like we nailed as a part of the storytelling process, um, you know. 
you had mentioned earlier that this you know this this film needs the momentum right yeah. it's a, it, 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 it can have the feeling of a static film but we, we needed to keep the energy throughout yeah. um, and I really felt like that's something that we nailed yeah. we, we were able to give the film this deliberate build yeah uh, until you know we get to the third act and where everything explodes right, right? and and I think that for me, um, you know the 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 twist of everything is, is fantastic, and I love that people. Um, you know, it's it's something new for them. It's it's fresh, uh, but I think that the idea of us taking our time with things and then letting everything just get out of control uh, was was it's really exciting to me that people are reacting well to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we had our first screening yesterday, yeah. last night, yeah. which was the first time that I've seen it on a big screen. That's the first time I've seen it with an audience, not just sitting at home on my computer. And the vocal reactions <laughs> that people were having were my absolute favorite, and they made me nice. smile yeah. and made me so happy. That's awesome. So, so that is very rewarding. Nice. Uh, because there is a twist, and there is a, a, a moment that everything shifts, did you talk about that with the writers beforehand, and did you, and how did you approach that with the actors? Was there a talk of where the actors can make that moment happen, and where you felt like in the script? I mean, you have to be very, very careful about these things, right? I mean, because yeah. if you do it at the wrong moment, it could just completely backfire, right? Right. right. So, and and there is a couple subtleties that make that moment even more stronger, right? Right, right. And I'm sure you talked about that with, with your cast. and Yeah, so the uh, Marcus DeVivo actually was the one who called Adam, and he said, he said, okay, I've got it. <laughs> and, and he pitched the twist to, to his co-writer, Adam, and Adam loved it, and then they started working the story backwards from there. Right. Um, and so, you know, for them, it was really about how can we, you know, that deliberate build, how can we create this thing and put all the pieces in place, but do it in such a subtle way that it's believable, mm -hmm. um, and but that it's enjoyable to watch, so that you know you don't see it coming. Um, and then, you know, as for working with Lizzie and Michael, it was, you know, for me, it was really one of those things that's like, how can we engage these characters? How can we make them uh, give up the pieces? that we want the audience to see, to feel a certain way about these people as, as we continue through the film. And I think that that aspect of the build was um, one, of, one of the things that we worked on a lot. Um, and it was definitely something that we worked on, uh, you know, crafting the performances, the wonderful performances that these guys gave in the editing room was like, okay, this take, you know, maybe I asked for too much. And that, but this take was perfectly like mm. right on the line of nice. what we need, you know. So it, it it became this really fine balance, you know, um, both in, in working with these guys and in the post production process. Did you guys find that freeing, being able to play with that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, let's be honest. That month that we were filming was a dream come true. Yeah. You know, we, we were playing all month long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was just wonderful. Yeah. So I, yeah. 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 I think too, just Drew, our fearless leader, you know, however fast you may have felt on the inside, you kept such a cool and calm demeanor. Yes. You kept more Al up and, and um, I think I, I remember on our most, you know, one of the nights where just everything was going wrong, yeah. nothing that we had planned was happening the way we had planned it. Hello, Indy um, <laughs> you know, I found myself uh, starting to freak out a little bit because you're like, oh my God, all of the beats and shifts, everything is different. Yeah, you yeah. know, our moments aren't landing. And, and Drew, by the end of the night, it ended up being my favorite night of the shoot, I think, because of what Drew was able to just keep everybody together and keep the team strong. Yes and just alleviate fears that this was not going to be the night that we needed to have, um, which was probably the biggest learning curve of, of the shoot for me, was just like, don't freak out. <laughs> <laughs> it may not all be okay, but it may be okay. It may all be okay, you know? Well, in your case, that might be helpful. Right. right that you freaked out. <laughs> right, right, right. No, uh, so that being said, you guys did this incredible 30-day night shoot, but you, you obviously you have a love for this film. So what do you love about indie film? What is it that you really cherish? You see so many risks being taken. Um, the strangeness sometimes. The, the fact, it's the same reason why I think um, horror, you can get away with so much in horror. Mm. It doesn't seem like studios 
keep such a close eye. They're like, yeah, go go do your thing. It's yeah. not gonna it's not gonna win an Academy Award anyway. You know, Tony Collette should have won Best Actress the year that she was in Hereditary, and I, I just you know what I mean. Like that will bother me forever. That she, you know what I mean. But but to that point, it's like you can go to extremes, and people will and they'll let you. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I'm not really one for big blockbusters usually mm -hmm. because I find that the pace of indie film can you know it can take its time it, it can it can do whatever it wants in a certain yes. way without necessarily worrying about the commercial you know producing right. aspect nice. so I find myself drawn to indie films smaller films much more often um, as far as working as an actress I feel like because we had such a great month and because we had such a wonderful experience I just want to make another one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've been on TV sets, completely, completely different uh, ball game. Yeah. And I think the indie film production experience is so much more rewarding. Um, so nice. that's, I'm so happy to know that and to have gotten to experience it in a feature with these guys. Nice. Uh, this was my first feature film, so nice. so although I, I don't feel like I can speak to you know bigger commercial projects, I think one of the things that uh, was special about this project for me was that it, it felt like I was able to own it. You know, um, I don't own it, but but the creative behind it and the creative process and, and the choices that were being made were all things that you know. Um, thankfully, my partners trusted me. Uh, to make this and to bring it to the screen faithfully from from what the writers wrote, um, and uh, and you know hopefully we we at least break even right. <laughs> hopefully we get distribution. Uh, but I think that um, you know that was that was one of the more exciting things for me about making a big independent project was that you know I I really had that creative control um, nice. over the whole thing. Nice. Thank you.